Now let's bring the discussion back to studio now. Winnie Madikizela Mandela is not only being hailed for being fearless in the face of brutality, but she's also being recognized as one of the women who confronted patriarchy head on. To discuss her impact on young women, we're joined now in studio by the Minister of Science and Technology, Mamaloko Kubai Ngobane. Thanks very much for coming into studio. Thank you for the invite. I mean, we're talking about Mama Winnie as one of the women who impacted this fight against patriarchy, but I mean, she is up there as the top women in the country who did just that. No, definitely. I think Mama stands as one of the best, um, a role model to many of us as young people growing up. Um, looking at her, I mean, I, I keep on saying to people, even at times where you think you want to give up, if you look at Mama, you just ask yourself, but what I'm going through is nothing. She's endured a lot of pain, humiliation, everything, anything that you can name. But she never kept give up. She kept her head high she really made sure that her voice was not silenced. So she's such a role model that many of us looked up to. Um, we continue to look up to her. I mean, uh, you look at what she has gone through, it, it's just amazing that such a human being, I mean, can go through that and still have a peace of mind and still be able to laugh and still be able to walk amongst the streets and not be grumpy, not be grudgy. I mean, that's, that's what you get. It's such an amazing I mean, story I'm about sure her I she had life. moments where she must have felt overwhelmed, where she must have looked back on her life and felt uh, the sadness of, of everything she went through. But the fact that she survived all those years of torture, that in itself is incredible. No, but she tells you that those things made her very strong. Instead of making her to feel like she should give up, to feel like it's not worth it. Actually, it made her more resolute. It made her feel that she needed to do more. And she continued. She's one of the leaders that remained within the community. I mean, you can talk to anyone. We grew up in Soweto, I grew up in Soweto. Anyone who is in Soweto doesn't know where Mama Winnie, like now, you don't even ask people, you don't hear people asking their address. This is a person who opened her home to many of us. As young women, you'd go there as you arrive, maybe at the time, even at the time when I was in the youth league, ANC youth league in the province. She would even say to us, look, Ndana, don't think it's going to be easy. You are going to have to fight for your voice. Don't give up. It's not easy. He says the label, says the patriarchal society that we live in. It's so entrenched in such a way. And, and remember the, the issue of patriarchy, it's not even about race because there are certain things that, for example, if you are in the ANC, you'd know they are outside the ANC. Patriarchy exists even within the ANC. Now you have to fight it, start from the household, go fight it, start it within your organization and then society. And in the workplace, I mean, there are a number of examples that we can make where women are trying to push for their voice. Uh, they are trying to push for saying, you know, can we be heard? We are here. Don't treat me different. Don't treat me as a sexual object. But because we live in a, in a patriarchal society, the infrastructure, the design of our society, how we are being socialized, it's in a patriarchal manner. But it makes it difficult. It makes it one of the most difficult thing to overcome. In fact, women, women themselves, us ourselves, we mm. are part of the reason why patriarchy is so entrenched. Yes. But it's because how, of how we socialized. Now you look at Mama Winnie. I mean, there are a lot of people who can tell you about stories. She didn't need a crowd to be heard. Whether she was left alone, she would make sure that if it's about me speaking, I'm going to speak. If, I mean, those who are narrating, obviously some of us were not yet there, those who are narrating the time of June 16, that in the midst of those bullets, in the midst of the cloud, she went in and said, no, hell, no, I'm going to pick up some of these children and take them to the hospital. I'm not going to wait for them to die. And a, a lot of parents were standing by, fearing that the police will kill them, fearing that they will be targeted. But she said, whatever comes my way, I'm prepared for it. I mean, one of the things, just I'm sure you've been reading, uh, rereading the literature around Mama Winnie's life over the past few days. And one of the things that stands out as uh, the more heartbreaking things in her life was how she was torn away from her children. And you talk about how she addressed uh, people like yourself as children, mm -hmm. in a way. She, she had this way of mothering people. It's perhaps one of the saddest parts of her life that she wasn't able to have that same 
kind of intimate motherly relationship with her children during the times that she was imprisoned and banished. Uh, but it's something that she embraced people from all walks of life. Definitely. Mama was a mother to all of us. I, I, and I think the children, um, her children, shared her with many of us because everywhere Mama went, anywhere Mama was at home, as long as people knew that she's at home, there will always be people coming for various reasons, advice and everything. So because of that, she's, she's got that instinct of just being a mother where she will never judge, she will give advice, she will give you hope. Even in the most difficult things, when you go there, I remember at some point in Gauti, we organized young women to go to sit with her, just to say, how did you do it? What, what gave you such strength? And she would say, it's my people. Because staying in Soweto, being surrounded by South Africans and the people of Soweto gave her strength. And that's why the apartheid government realized that strength and decided to break her, take her out of Soweto to another area. But if you read it again, you look at the literature, you look at the books, you look at the movie that they've done, and you see that even that did not get her deterred. She arrived, she mobilized. Social worker that she is, I mean, she's everything, an activist, a community leader. She went and started leading in that context again. So this is why I'm saying many of us, when you look at her life, what we go through daily makes it nothing yeah you kind of think what am i actually complaining about exactly i was just reading some of the articles around uh, her life as well and there, there's a lot of uh, literature at the moment talking about the fact that yes she was a stalwart of the african national congress but in many ways she stood almost outside of the party in a way just in the way that she could relate to people like members of the eff kosatu speaks very fondly of her as well she was almost above being part of just one political party as much as the ANC was her life? She was a community leader. That's what you can describe here. When a person is a community leader and is a leader within society, it's across political party lines. Everybody in society can relate with Mama because she did not see party. She understood even the essence of what ANC stands for because ANC, as we define it, is a leader of society. So the principles and the founding uh, policies of ANC sees ANC within and amongst the masses, sees ANC within and amongst communities. She lived and practically showed what a true ANC cadre needs to be. Now, before we, before we let you go, a lot of people have been sharing their more intimate moments, uh, just their one-on-one -on -one interactions with Mama Winnie. What stands out for you, and as a leader within the ANC yourself, uh, what is it that you'd like to take from her in your work in the, the governing party? Look, um, when I got appointed as Minister of Energy, that was my first appointment. Actually, I've always thought Mama knew me as part of the group. I didn't think she even had my number. So after appointment, she called me. She says, Mdanam, I've seen you rise within the ANC. Who's Take care of yourself, but you must conduct yourself in such a manner that it resembles your organization. He says, you must remain loyal to the organization and the people of South Africa. Then after my second reshuffle communication, she well, called. Well, let me stop you there. Getting that call from her, what was that like for you? To, to answer the phone and on the, on the other side of the line is it's none mom. other. It was very exciting because this is a woman I look up to, up to. I mean, I've said in many interviews, even last year, where somebody said, my role model is Mama Winnie. It was very exciting to think that, I think, to know that she had my number. I didn't even ask her, where did you get my number? But after that, she made it quite regular calls. Um, two hours, uh, if I'm in a meeting, my peer will know she would have to pull me out, and then I'll tell her, excuse me, there's no, I'm not talking to her. Because every time you spoke to her, there's something you take away from. She will ask you something. If she had something, she will pick up a call. I mean, she called me several times where there were reports about a number of things. And then I will account. When I was reshuffled to communication, she called me. Okay, mama. 
Ghana, ma, you know. And she says, no, I'm reading a lot of stuff about um, what happened with you at Energy. So after explaining everything, I said, but mama, I'm content where I am. I'm happy at Indiavui. We spoke more than three hours, and I was in a meeting. So I had to get the guys to wait. We were doing briefings um, as I was being orientated. So I had to get, a, a, a get out and then listen to her. We spoke, says, no, I'm happy. Then she asked me about a number of things. And, she, and then I started, oh, OK, ma'am. She says, no. Remember when you were acting deputy chief whip, I used to talk to her son. Oh, I couldn't even remember because if you remember during that time as well, most of the time she was not in parliament. But when she see me at times she would say, you must remember to put my apology. So it was, she was such a loving, caring, but for somebody like me who would receive a call, who would say, you are a young woman, you are rising. These are opportunities that were never available for us when we were growing up. Please don't mess up. Um, many young people are going to look up to you, those who are coming after you. Remember to be a good example for them because you have us that are guiding you. But as well, make sure that you assist them to understand the organization, assist them to understand what is important about this democracy and why we came here. And she used to say, Ngomso Sizabisingheko, we are leaving this in your hands as younger generation. You have to take you have to look up to we, you, young people have to look up to you so it's it's such something that we take away i personally uh, take away and i think it even influence how i do things in my work because i knew every time it's not only her it's mama sophie the other time we were traveling we we're at airport she stopped me as i was rushing to her flight and she was talking about somebody she says I'm, i was worried about you because it looks like you were keeping bad company and i was sitting and i'm like i wonder who is this bad company i had to later phone and say, say it on air no and then i had to call and ask mama who did you speak about so it's this women that we look up to as younger generation who always becomes our conscience mm. as younger generation to say, let their pain, let their suffering not go in vain. We have to do our best where we are given responsibilities and reflect what do they stand for and make them proud. Absolutely. Well, thanks very much for coming in and sharing those special memories with us. It was Minister of Science and Technology, Mamaloko Kubayan Gubani.